Skillshare is for designers, photographers, marketers, artists, and lifelong learners. Skillshare is for foodies, commuters, risk takers, the young, and the young at heart. It's for strategists, free spirits, purists, the bold, the curious, the characters, the makers, and the breakers. Skillshare is for everyone, an online learning community with thousands of classes to advance your career, improve the world, and pursue the work you love. What will you learn next? It all starts on Skillshare. We talked about words in the previous lesson uh, in terms of uh, the parts of speech and what words do, and they have meanings um, uh, uh, either in and of themselves or they um, uh, uh, provide linkages uh, with, with other words. They help us uh, combine words or groups of words. But by themselves, words don't have meaning or their meaning is not complete. For instance, if I said train, you might ask, well, what about the train? Is the train coming? Uh, is she going to take a trip on a train? Uh, does she like trains? Uh, does she want me to look at the train? Uh, does she want me to train her dog? Does she want me to train for the big game? You see, so words by themselves uh, have a meaning that is inconclusive, um, ambiguous, uh, incomplete. So, uh, and that's why we need the sentence. The sentence is a unit of meaning that um, helps us convey our complete thoughts. So you might ask yourself, why a sentence? Why do we have to know what a sentence is? Well, the conventional definition of a sentence is that it conveys a complete thought. It contains a complete thought. Though that's not a good technical definition, it'll do for the moment, and we'll get to more specific definitions later. Think back on my train example earlier. Uh, it's bad enough if somebody doesn't spell out their complete thought in speech, but if they don't, at least you can go back and ask, what about the train? Okay, and, you know, what are you trying to tell me about the train? You know, you know, please tell me more. But in writing, remember, all you have are those little black marks on a piece of paper or on the computer screen or whatever color you choose to make either or, but, but all you have are the letters that you write down and the words and the combination of words. That's all. There's no going back and asking for further information. So your writing will be much less effective, much more less intelligible, much less clear if you don't learn to write in complete sentences. So that's why we're going to be discussing what the sentence is and how to effectively use it. Sentences are necessary. They're necessary in business and in academic writing. Uh, one reason is very practical. Uh, that's the convention. Those are the rules of the game. In academic writing, your instructors, your professors will grade you down if uh, you do not write in complete sentences. In business writing as well, um, uh, you'll either confuse your customers or, or so put them off because they think that they're dealing with somebody who doesn't know how to write properly in the language or what's considered proper. Uh, and in general, uh, you very well run the risk, if you don't use complete sentences, of coming across as illiterate and not very intelligent. So, that's why we need to know what a sentence is. So, what a complete sentence? Sometimes, uh, these or similar definitions are offered that a sentence is a way to express yourself. It's a group of words that makes a statement. It's a group of words that begins with a uh, capital letter, ends with a period, or some other form of punctuation, ending uh, punctuation. It's a group of words that includes a subject or a verb, and, or one of the most popular and one that I was taught when I was younger is the sentence is a complete thought. Well, these are all partly true, and true in a kind of a vague and general way, but they're not really helpful in that they're testable, in that we can look at our writing and actually tell whether we've written a, um, a sentence or not. So uh, as we go forward in just the next couple slides, uh, we're going to discuss how we can tell whether we have indeed written a complete sentence. One issue with these is that they don't really define 
what is a sentence versus what is a not sentence. Again, use it with some irritating air quotes. Um, take the last definition, for example, a sentence defined as a complete thought. It's true in a way, but not a good e definition because it's inexact. What does complete mean? Um, so if someone to, were to step on your toe and you yelled, ouch, you, know, uh, you could argue that's a sentence because it's your complete thought at the moment. You don't think anything else, uh, but it's not a sentence. So we need some other type of definition for what a sentence is, and that's what we're going to get at. In another way, the question of a complete thought fails us as a definition of a sentence. Sometimes, for instance, I'll give my students a sentence such as the cat sat on the mat and ask whether that's a complete sentence or not. And some students will say it's not a complete sentence because they want more information. What color was the cat? What kind of mat was it? What time of day was it? Where was it? Were there any other animals in the room? So, uh, so you can have something that is a complete sentence, though it might not satisfy all your particular requirements for information. So what is a sentence? Well, the fact is that a sentence can be defined quite objectively. Uh, there are three requirements for a sentence, and those are a subject, which is either a, a noun, a pronoun, or a noun phrase, and I'm going to ex be explaining all of these. A predicate, which is a verb acting in a particular way in the sentence. Um, not just any verb, but a very particular kind of verb or fulfilling a particular role in the sentence, and what's called an independent clause. So, three requirements. And once we learn those, we'll be able to tell immediately whether a group of words is a sentence or not. So the first requirement of a sentence is that the sentence have a subject. And this is not that the sentence has to be about something, as in the subject was roses, a name of a 1960s era play and film, uh, but that there is a person, place, or thing. Remember the noun or the pronoun that takes its place, a person, place, or thing that is doing something. Uh, and as awkward as this might sound, as funny as it might sound, is doing the doing that the verb is doing. So there's a verb attached to, to that uh, person, place, or thing. So, and I have some examples here, and you can look over at, at the examples. Um, the cat sat on the mat. So here we have this uh, sentence again. We're very involved with cats. Um, uh, the cat sat on the mat. You see, so what is the cat doing? The cat's sitting. Okay. It, uh, the boy hit the ball. What did the boy do? He hit the ball. You see, so that's the subject of the verb. Uh, the dog barked. What did the dog do? Well, the dog barked. You see, so it's the it's the person, place, or thing that's doing the doing that the verb is describing. Okay. Uh, uh, now, not all not always does the verb have to be an action verb, uh, as I talked about. Tom likes action movies. Okay, he likes them. You see, so there's no movement involved in 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 that verb, but Tom is the subject of the verb. I thought I did well on the test. The teacher thought otherwise, but I thought I did well. You see, so uh, I is the subject, and what is I doing? Well, I am thinking, okay, or I thought, okay? So that's the subject. It's the requirement, uh, 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 number one, of a sentence. And at the end of this whole lesson, uh, uh, of course, there's a uh, text in uh, attached, and you can read that, but also uh, you have the opportunity to uh, test your uh, uh, your acquisition of this knowledge by taking a short quiz. Okay. And if you remember back to our brief explanation of what a verb does, um, re remember that a verb can also express not only action, but a state of being. And so the subject of a sentence could be uh, ex being expressed in a state of being. So, for instance, uh, again, uh, looking over at um, the uh, examples, uh, I could say, Scout is a golden retriever. Scout would be the subject of the sentence. She seems to be a nice dog, and she would be the subject. Or Fred is light, Fred being the subject of the verb to be. Joanna is tall, Joanna being the subject. And uh, Pedro looks very efficient. You know, so, so these are the expressions of a state of being. And the noun that is attached to the verb 
uh, is the subject of the sentence. The second requirement is that the sentence contain a predicate or, as you might know it, a verb. Um, but I like to use the word predicate because it is the um, definition of the verb acting in a particular way and in a particular relationship with the other words in the sentence. Um, a sentence can have more than one verb, but, but not all of them are the, the verb of the sentence. So, so I hope that's clear in one way or another, and as you go forward, it'll become more clear. It, the predicate is the verb acting in a particular role in the sentence. So you might think of it as the main verb of the sentence. Uh, it's the doing that the subject of the sentence is doing. Okay, so, so for instance, in the examples that we have, uh, the cat sat on the mat. Well, we talked about the cat being the subject. Well, what is the cat doing? The cat is sitting. The cat sat. The soldier raised the flag. Again, the soldier is raising the flag. So the raising the flag is what the soldier is doing. So we see this relationship goes through all these sentences. Um, we celebrated Christmas at home. What did we do? We celebrated Christmas. We celebrated. Okay. So do, so I hope you start to see that kind of re, re relationships. The Smiths live on Main Street. What do they do? You know, they live on Main Street. They live, okay, so, or reside, they dwell, okay. Um, so, and in the same way, uh, the, you know, the quiet actions, likes Tom, likes action movies, I thought I did well on the test. Um, the, you know, the likes would be the verb, likes would be the verb of, uh, of, uh, of the sentence, you know, Tom likes action movies. Thought would be the predicate of the uh, uh, sentence. I thought I did well on the test, and in the same way, the you know the verbs, um, uh, uh, the um, the verbs that express the state of being. Uh, Scout is a golden retriever. You know, is you know the verb to be uh, would be the um, the predicate of the sentence, scout is a golden retriever, and so on and so forth. So, so I hope you start to see these types of, um, uh, these types of relationships, because the subject and the predicate are in relationship with one another, okay, and, uh, and if you can identify one, uh, sometimes that'll help you identify the others. So sometimes we have problems. What's the subject of the sentence, or what's the predicate? Uh, sometimes the trick is just see if you can grab hold of one and then figure it so so if that one is the subject you you uh, say okay what is this subject doing what is the cat doing well it's sitting on the mat so sap must be the verb or if you can identify the main uh, verb the predicate then you work backwards from that and say okay so what is sitting so what's doing the sitting okay what sat the cat okay anyway so so I hope this starts to become a little bit clear and as I've stated before, we have a text attached, and you can have a little quiz, and of course you can uh, ask me any questions that you might have. The third requirement of a sentence is that it contain an independent clause. And so I have to explain what this is, and in some cases it might get a little bit complicated, but I'll do my best to simplify it. A independent clause is a clause that could stand as a sentence on its own. That's number one. Number two is it is not dependent. Okay, so what's dependency? Okay, so let me give you a couple of examples of dependent clauses. Maybe you can start to get a feel for um, just what they are. If you understand this. Okay. When the rain starts. Okay. Because we were late. So, do you notice what's happening I mean, as you listen to me say those things? Well, besides that you're getting irritated, I'm sure. Uh, you're waiting for me to finish the sentence. Okay? Uh, because it is raining, uh, we will stay inside. Okay? Uh, if you understand this, please raise your hand. Okay, so you see, so each one of those clauses that begins with what's called a dependent conjunction or subordinating conjunction requires an independent clause to complete it. So you cannot have a sentence that is only a dependent clause, or a dependent clause does not make a sentence by itself. And so um, if you wrote, um, uh, if 
the plane arrives on time, period, that would be a sentence fragment. It would not be a complete sentence because it does not have a an independent clause uh, attached. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, so I hope this kind of explains what it is that we want to um, uh, uh, understand about this requirement, and I'll explain more in the text. And of course, you can test your knowledge in the quiz as we go forward. To go into more depth about the independent clause, dependent clause, um, take a look at the example that I have over here. The, um, the independent clause is not dependent on something else. It doesn't depend on something else. So example, we have the sentence, because I don't finish my sentences. Now that's a dependent clause, and as such, it's a sentence fragment. It's not a complete sentence. And it's largely the because that makes it so. Okay, So there'd be two ways to correct this. And we'll get more into this when we talk about fragments. But for right now, uh, there's two ways to correct this. One is you can drop the because. I don't finish my sentences. That is an independent clause. It's not dependent on anything else. It can stand by itself. And also, I could add an independent clause to that dependent clause. Because I don't finish my sentences, you are getting irritated. You see, so that you are getting irritated is an independent clause. It doesn't begin with a because or a when or a while or an if. It can stand by itself as a sentence. We have a couple more concepts to deal with in terms of the sentence. Uh, but first, I want to congratulate you on sticking with this so far, because grammar is tough. It uh, requires a lot of concentration to uh, get straight. So anyway, so what we want to talk about now is the direct object. So we have the subject of the sentence, and that's what is performing the action. The direct object receives the action. So again, uh, I think that we can understand sometimes better if we use examples. So in the example over here, we have the boy hit the ball. You see, so the boy is the subject. We should know this by now. And hit is the verb. That's the predicate. What did the boy hit? He hit the ball. Okay, so the ball is what's receiving the action. It's the direct object. In some of the other examples that we have, Sally drove the car into the wall. Well, what did Sally drive? She drove the car. Okay, uh, so car would be the object, the direct object of the verb. After the game, the players celebrated their victories. Okay, so what did this player celebrate? They celebrated the victory. The victory would be the direct object. What would be the subject? Little quiz. What would be the subject? The players. They're the ones who are celebrating. Okay, and celebrate would be, of course, the predicate. The president gave the speech before Congress. So ask yourself, what's the subject of that sentence? What is the person, place, or thing that's doing the doing? Uh, well, that would be the president. What did the president do? President gave. What did the president give? Oh, he gave the speech. So that would be the direct object. Something to keep in mind is that some verbs require a direct object. So, for instance, the verb to catch doesn't quite make sense without a direct object. So, for instance, if I said something like Fred caught, You'd be left wondering, well, what did Fred catch? Did he catch a cold? Did he catch the ball? Did he catch a giant marlin? See, so the verb to catch requires the direct object. And so I believe the verb to have, to have something in terms of uh, uh, to possess something. So if I said they had, you'd be wondering, well, what do they have? Okay, so did they have a nice house? Uh, did they have a new car? Okay, so do they have a lot of trouble? So you'd require a direct object to be attached to uh, that usage of the verb to have. Some verbs, on the other hand, can take it or leave it. Okay. They, uh, uh, they can either take a direct object or go without a direct object. So I could say, for instance, John left is in he went away. Or he left something specific. He left the party. Or he left his keys on the table. So in that sense, the verb to leave and many other verbs like that can either take a direct object or not. The indirect object also serves as an important function in the sentence. We have to be able to identify that as well. 
it identifies to or for whom an action is being performed. So you might have a sentence, the president sent the victims of the hurricane aid. Okay, so what would be the direct object and what would be the indirect object? Well, we should be able to tell by now that the direct object would be that which the president sent. What did the president send? He sent aid. Whom did he send the aid to? To the victims. Okay, so you see, so you can rephrase that original sentence, the president sent the victims of the hurricane aid, as a sentence he sent aid to the victims of the hurricane. So that's to or for whom an action is performed. Okay. Uh, another example, example number two uh, in, uh, in the uh, examples to the side here. The company offered its employees a raise. So what did the company offer? They offered a raise. Whom did they offer the raise to? To the employees. And so you see the restated sentence here. Uh, they offered the raise to its employees. Molly baked her mother a birthday cake. What did Molly bake? Well, I hope she didn't bake her mother. No, I would hope that she baked a birthday cake. But she baked the birthday cake for her mother. So again, you can see that we can rephrase the sentence. She baked a birthday cake for her mother. Okay, so that's the indirect object. And a very simple way to be able to figure out what is playing the role of the indirect object in the sentence is to see if you can rephrase the sentence using two or four uh, to, uh, to discover what is the... Uh, indirect object as opposed to the direct object because we don't want Molly baking her mother. So there we have it. You survived. You should get a t-shirt. But besides that, you should by now have a thorough grounding in what constitutes a sentence in English and what are its components. Now, uh, in this same section, uh, in a different video, I'm going to go over briefly another kind of sentence, uh, but I will save that for another lesson, for another day, and in the meantime, you can congratulate yourself and go off and have a well-deserved reward, your t-shirts in the mail.